Hello, and welcome to another episode of Goblin Lore. In this episode, we get a chance to talk to Aaron Campbell, Queen Supreme of Dredge in all sorts of formats of competitive magic, about her own journey and struggles with emotions and tilt in the game of magic. This is a really compelling topic, I think, to us because it's that part of Magic the Gathering where not just the story element of the Vorthos can live and exist. We talk about story emotions and and how emotions are portrayed in the magic storyline, but we also get a chance to talk about some of the elements of competitive magic and how playing the game does factor into our enjoyment of the game, our feeling of that atmosphere. There can still be frustration, there can still be joy, there can still be sorrow, there can still be surprise even when we get into story elements. And so even though a lot of what we talk about is playing the game of magic and competitive magic, a lot of this does tie into our own perceptions of magic story, of announcements by the creative team. This is part of goblin lore trying to present a holistic approach to the entire community of magic and aside from that Aaron is an outstanding guest we actually had to break this up into two episodes this is part one of two because Aaron had so many people interested in her episode that we have an entire mailbag full of questions for her so without any further ado let's get to the show Hello, Podwalkers, and welcome to another episode of Goblin Lore. This week, we are joined by the legendary Dredge Queen, Erin Campbell. Erin is joining us to talk about how tilt can affect gameplay, and also how overcoming this does not mean losing your passion. We'll also be diving into a discussion about emotions and how they are expressed, along with our typical kind of real-world examples. Uh, We actually had talked to Erin about doing this episode back when we saw her at GP Minneapolis. And just with things that have happened recently, especially with the shooting at the Madden tournament, felt that this could be a very timely episode to do. But before we get too deep, I want to give my lovely co-host time to introduce themselves, tell our listeners where they can find you on Twitter, and share a character and magic lore that exemplifies your current emotional state. So I'm Erin Campbell. You can find me on Twitter at Original Asterisk. That's O-R-I-G-I-N-A-L-O-E-S-T-R-U-S. Uh, my Twitter account is protected, so you would have to send me a request to follow. But uh, assuming you're not a creeper and you appear to be a real person, I will probably accept. Um, <laughs> so definitely go ahead and do that. I do screen. It's what it's the thing I do. And so so I'd love to have you. You know, you're welcome to, to my little crazy world. And, you know, it's funny. If I had to choose a character that exemplifies my current state, you know, I, I fancied myself a Liliana because I, of the sultriness. And, and and the dead things, but the, the the older I get, the more I realize that I am such a Chandra, and so uh, I would probably say I'm closer to to Chandra right now than than I than I'd like to admit. But um, I'm also really into Varaska's kind of grown and sexy phase that we're we're seeing in, in Guilds of Ravnica. So <laughs> so I could be I, I'm so here for it. So I could be moving more towards Varaska, but right now I'd say I'm I'm I'm, I'm a Chandra. I would say that art that we had spoiled this week for Varaska was just absolutely amazing. you don't understand magali i can't with her i can't I, know. I was at work i was at work i was on a phone call i was talking to an investor i happened to glance over at my phone i saw that <laughs> art i couldn't you don't understand i literally like hit my desk i was like damn it like i just magali is one of those artists that like when you think when you think it can't get any better than this like you see the hunt master you see you know, whatever comes out, and you're like, you know, this is it. Maybe she's peaked. You know, maybe, maybe she's gonna plateau. <laughs> and then Magali's like, hold my beer, and then she comes out with something <laughs> else. And I just, the, she's literally the definition of I can't even. Like, I look at her art every single time. The RPTQ play mat. I don't know if you saw that. There was the Varaska sitting in the throne of like the stone throne with like the heads. I literally just like clutch my chest because I'm like, how are you like this? I just can't. And so, so God bless Magali because she just turns it out every time, and I just, I just don't know what to do with myself. And I'm Joe Rediman. You can find me on Twitter at Fintorn. That's F-Y-N-D Horn. I, I took this question a little bit jokingly. So I'm going with uh, Kong Ming, Sleeping Dragon, who was reprinted in Masters 25, but is originally from Portal 3 Kingdoms. And uh, that's just because I haven't had any coffee this week. So I'm, I'm really tired. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything to add to this. It, it's just it's sleepy. I did find a, a good card, uh, Sick and Tired, too, but I'm not feeling ill. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that doesn't have any characters on it other than a, a weird like vomiting goblin. Well, apropos, <laughs> I'm Alex Newman. Uh, I can be found on Twitter at Alexander Newm. And uh, right now, I'm thinking Gideon is kind of a character that fits for me. A, a little bit less emotion state, but he in the story is kind of going through this journey of figuring out who he is after kind of having lost a lot of things on Amonkhet. And, and I kind of, I'm feeling that. I'm kind of in that place myself. I thought um, it just meant that you were working out more, like you were just feeling beefy. Like <laughs> <laughs> I am Hobbskew. I can be found at Hobbskew on Twitter. Um, and I'm actually going with not a legendary creature, Frenetic Afrit. So it's a great card. It's a lot of fun because they also made it where you can basically just keep flipping coins. So in coin flipping decks, it's great because they re-erratted that you can just keep activating the zero ability. But I just feel like with my new job, the fact that Jen and I are going to be having a baby, you know, we moved into a house, we got married in the last year, we just had all of these transitions that at times I just feel very frenetic, like that I'm just kind of off kilter, kind of, yeah. So I saw this card and was like, yep, that's me. Is this the first reveal of Baby Hobbs on the cast? Oh, yeah, it probably is. Oh, I'm oh my so gosh. happy for you. And I'm so happy for me because that means I have more baby pictures to ogle over. We always start with a magic history and story component. So today the theme is talking about Jaya and Chandra and their very red dealings with emotions and how that relates to us. Jaya Ballard is one of our earlier planeswalkers that we find out about in the magic story. She was around in the saga of the Ice Age, was involved with helping Joda stop a ton of necromancers and evil sorcerers early on in magic but specifically Jaya is a pyromancer she deals with fire as kind of one of the most notable flavor text characters in early magic uh, i i still love her card i think it's burnout is the the flavor text is just gotcha <laughs> quote Jaya ballard during this whole time she had to deal with Basically, it was a it was a long storyline that was all these issues that Joda was getting into and Jaya was helping him fix until the Shattered Alliance, which was the story that coincided with Alliances, the set. Jaya has gotten possessed by the spirit of Marisol the Pretender, who is a uh, former sorcerer that Joda helped to kill. And in order to help her rid herself of this spirit, Joda smashed a mirror of his over her head, which is one of the most ridiculous parts of Magic Story, by the way. I think it's just, <laughs> that's bizarre. Hey, friend, here, I know it's going to solve your problems. Smash. It, it turns out the mirror was enchanted by Freya, at least one of the other planeswalkers that had been involved in the story. It sparks Jaya's planeswalker spark. And through this, like, blazing inferno she becomes a planeswalker and essentially just burns this possessive spirit soul that's where she sparked i kind of just briefly want to go back because talking about her development she basically started out as a thief i mean she was kind of she was actually she tried to steal from joda and he noticed that she had the magical ability and she she became a task mage i mean she wasn't like really i mean there's actually a discussion about the fact that in the early storylines that she had a lot in the flavor text but was really a secondary character for storylines but she was so popular i mean there was so much love for her i mean the we get her card in the time spiral block specifically not because of the storyline but because fans loved her i mean they really wanted her to to be this which was a move from secondary and then now it's much higher. Now we're seeing her a lot because we're seeing her with the return to Dominaria once she's actually basically old. And we know very little about what happened in between other than the fact that she basically kind of went and worked with, well, she inspired She actually inspired the whole religion. So I don't, you were telling me the story, so. Yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of this is we found this out in the Dominaria storyline, I, I believe, if I remember right. We found out that Jaya was Mother Luti, who is this older protector of this monk enclave of, of pyromancers, of, of fire mages, on the faraway plain of Ragatha. And this was one of the bigger reveals that had been sort of building up over a couple of years. And Chandra had no idea how she got there, how Jaya had gotten there, because, you know, Chandra didn't understand that Jaya was a planeswalker originally and all this, you know, all these things in here. So Chandra is questioning Jaya and trying to figure all this out and is like, but you're worshipped in this religion on Regatha. And, you know, what? how did all this happen? And 
Jaya essentially says like, oh yeah, I got really drunk one night with a bunch of monks on Regatha and told them about all of my super cool exploits. And then I came back a hundred years later and they started a religion based on me. Chandra kind of has become the protege of Jaya. And as you were hinting at before, Aaron, she learns a lot about how to control her powers and control her emotions and and process things through her mentorship with Jaya. Both of them are pyromancers. Both of them use fire. Both of them are highly emotional and highly incendiary people. But Chandra comes from the plain of Kaladesh where she was persecuted as a child. When Chandra was discovered to have magical fire abilities, that became a huge taboo because fire magic is strictly outlawed on Kaladesh. And so as a young girl, Chandra was captured and subsequently almost executed. She she sparked at what would have been her execute. You know, understandably, she's had a lot of problems with controlling her emotions, with lashing out, with not really, I think, knowing how to relate to people a ton. Uh, You know, there's there's been a lot of stuff she's had to go through and, and really has had to grow up really fast. And that, in my mind, plays a lot into her process of you know this rocky up and down points that she's had to do you know as she's gotten close to the gate watch and as she's learned how to be essentially a hero and then in meeting up with jaya in in training with the monks on regatha where she you know ended up in the purifying fire novel she's really had to learn about how to be reflective and how to you know process things in a healthy way um and then we see that especially in the Dominaria storyline where Jaya takes her under her wing and helps her focus her energy, focus her powers, and, and focus her mind. I think a part of that, too, a piece that was interesting to me was at first Chandra's plan during Dominaria was, I'm going to go find Jaya so she can teach me to be better at fire. And eventually Jaya got her to figure out it's not being better at fire, it's learning how to manage yourself, learning how to manage your emotions can help you learn that. But the first step isn't just learning to make better fire. Well, and Alex, weren't you talking a little bit about like attempts that Chandra has made previously to kind of shut herself off from her abilities because of it being more out of control or being kind of more unbridled? Yeah, I, I think in the story previously, she was more... She... I, th- I think her, her philosophy was that she needed to shut off her emotions as opposed to learning how to work with them, learning how to channel them. So I, I think that's why she wasn't as successful to begin with. And then working with Jaya is when she learned how to channel emotions as opposed to trying to shut them off and then have things bottle up. And that's one of those things, too, that we see with red mages in particular in the story or red characters in the story is they they do seem to be more frenetic. They do seem to be more explosive. They do seem to be more out of control but it's fascinating to me that we have that mentor character that jaya character in this story to provide that guideline that map of i mean she is almost the one-to-one proto chandra and how you know showing that there is a meditative and a contemplative side to red is really cool yeah and that's that's an interesting point too joel i think before this recent storyline that included jaya and chandra there was talk that chandra was just you know jaya light of her i've heard that before but i think this was a really good way to show how they're different people and can learn from each other even if they've had a similar path in life yeah so i i really relate to the storyline because i my biggest weakness as a magic player has always been my emotions and specifically with dealing with loss um i have not I, I'm still not, to be completely honest. I've never really been a good loser. And, um, you know, when I first, I used to be really, really bad. Like years ago, I was I was really bad. And I remember this was something I had never really experienced before in any other game. And so I would turn to, you know, articles and resources and try to get some assistance with this because, again, this was something I never really experienced before. And one article after another, it was just, it was always very to the point. It was like, well, just don't do it. Just just don't do it. It's that simple. Just Just don't do it. And I was like, well... That that's that's not really how emotions work. You know, like we we feel things all the time that we don't necessarily want to feel. You know, when somebody passes away, you feel sad and you don't want to be sad. No one wants to be sad when, you know, someone breaks up with you. You know, you have those feelings. And so, you know, nobody wants to be doing a lot of these things that no one wants to be feeling a lot of these things that we feel, but we do feel them. And and we need to find a way to manage it and, and process it and channel it rather than simply just flipping a switch and turning it off. And so when I was really going through it, you know, years ago, I really didn't know where to turn 
important because for everybody around me, it was as, to them, it was as simple as, well, just don't do it. And so the evolution from Chandra to Jaya, to me, is a really good example of, of how to deal with things like that, where, you know, instead of looking at emotions as, as a weakness or as a flaw, I'm I'm a strong, I'm, I'm better because I have emotions. You know, I look at having emotions as an asset. And so, you know, you're looking at Chandra, who's sort of unbridled and, and could be seen as, you know, even dangerous or unpredictable. And Jaya is sort of the end game of like where you want to be, where Jaya still has her spark, no pun intended. You know, Jaya is still sassy and Jaya still has that fire, but it's more controlled. It's more refined. And I really think in terms of your, in terms of, a, of an emotional journey, that's a really good blueprint for how it should be. It's not about, you know, lobotomizing Chandra or making her boring or taking away any of that. She can still have a lot of those traits that we love. It's just a matter of how you choose to um, how you choose to process it and how you choose to channel it. And so I really look up to those two because I feel like I'm kind of on that journey myself. And and it was such a relief to see the Jaya character and see that y- you can still have all of these things, you know, that your passion doesn't necessarily have to be your downside and that, you know, you can still have some spice to you and you can still have some unpredictability. It just, and it doesn't have to be, you know, kind of an either or problem. Position. And I know that for me in the past, I've struggled with how to still be a passionate, emotional person because I am. I mean, that's kind of part of who my identity is. It's 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 coupled with the empathy that's led me to be a psychologist to begin with, but still be able to let, let this affect my playing ability or just even having fun with playing magic. And I think that mm-hmm. we're going to talk about, you know, like I had dreams that I was going to be a competitive player at times. I did some of the grind, but... I found that like I really struggled with losing and I struggled with variance in particular and kind of trying to overcome that emotion when I would lose to something that my logical side would say, well, this person got lucky because there was a mathematical odds of them drawing. They had to top deck basically a one in 15 chance to be able to do that. You know, we've talked about this with probability. Well, that still happens. And my Mm -hmm. brain only remembers the times that the opponent would do that. And it was really tough for me because I'm a competitive person by nature. I mean, as a runner, I even now when I'm out of shape, if I'm out for a run and I see somebody, like I get really offended by getting passed by somebody. Like mm-hmm. I feel like I have to catch them even though I am not in the shape I was at 22. So my journey for this has been kind of that, Aaron, is that uh, how to manage my emotions and, and also Jen, just have fun still playing Magic. Yeah. So for me, you know, I, I've spent a, a number of years really looking at, you know, why, you know, I was the way that I was. And to be clear, I'm still not there yet. You know, I still have a game or two where I will slip and I, I will say something I shouldn't, but I catch it and I, I apologize immediately afterwards. And so so I just want to be clear, I'm still not there yet. And I think it's really important to emphasize that, that you don't necessarily have to be there's no like end game. You know, I, I think of it in a lot of ways and, and maybe this is problematic, but I'm going to say it anyways. It's almost kind of like an addiction where it's like, you know, somebody who's an alcoholic, you are always an alcoholic. Like you, you're going to your meetings and you may not have had a drink, but that's a label that that person will always carry, carry with them and a lot of times by choice. And so I tend to think of it in a similar vein of like, am I, can, can I say that I will be a great winner at some point in my life? I, I don't know that. You know, I, I've certainly made some great strides, but, you know, I hesitate to say that there's ever going to be like a an end game to that journey. And so, for me just kind of realizing what a lot of my what a lot of things were that kind of set me off you know the first thing was that I was just doing a lot of things I didn't want to be doing like you know you had mentioned Hobbs that one of the reasons you were getting upset was because you had wanted to be on the pro tour for me it was the opposite it was like I was doing all of these things and then going I don't even want to be on the pro tour like what am I doing like you know I'm going to these events I'm playing events I really don't want to be playing in quite honestly I'm playing decks I really don't like but someone's told me that they were good decks so I'm going to pick them up and then they don't work and then I'm upset about that and so you know, I was playing formats I didn't enjoy. I was playing decks I didn't enjoy. I was playing in events because I felt almost obligated to do so. I was just doing a lot of things I just didn't want to be doing. And, you know, I get a lot of flack for sort of being the dredge girl or sort of being the graveyard girl. But when I really started playing decks I loved, I just started enjoying the game more, you know. And so, you know, I don't play standard because I don't like standard. But there were years where I was just dragging myself through it because my local game, I didn't really get many events here. So I felt obligated to, like, support my local community. And so, you you know, when I just stopped doing things I didn't want to do, I just noticed that that really turned my attitude around where, you know, if I'm playing a deck, it's because I really want to play this deck and, and no one's told me to do it. And no one's. And if there's an event, there's an event in Detroit right now that I would have felt obligated to go to years ago because it's close ish by. I didn't want to go. 
I don't want to go. I don't want to play team constructed. And so, you know, I, you know, when I stopped, when I stopped doing things I didn't really want to do, I felt like my attitude improved. And when I just started getting my, re- my, my expectations in line where it's like, I'm not trying to get on the pro tour. I'm not trying to get a pro point. Like, you know, just sitting here and going, you know, and that's maybe that's one of the reasons why I enjoy vintage so much is because it is so low EV where it's like, you know, there's nothing really on the line. And so when I just started stripping away all of these things and really just got real about what I enjoy and why I'm playing, I felt like my attitude improved significantly. The thing I want, I really want to stress, because I feel like this is the biggest misconception, it rarely has to do with the other person. I can honestly say that when I, when I was at my worst, it never had to do with the other person. I was never mad at them. It was never anything. Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. There were, there were some opponents who talk crazy to you, and then you got to shut it down. That's a different story. But, you know, there... The, we can go there. That's fine. But what I'm saying is, when when I was when I the most of the time when I was was losing my cool, it was because of something I did. It was either me going, "Why did you play this card? Why did you sideboard this way? Why are you playing this deck? Why are you even here?" And me taking it out on the other person. It rarely has anything to do with the other person. And I know, I know that's not that's certainly not a justification for it. That's certainly not an excuse for it. But I feel like it often gets seen as as you're hot headed or you're looking for a fight. Most of the time, you're mad at yourself. That's that's really what it is. And you don't know how to deal with that. You don't know how to process it. You feel you feel like everyone's watching you. You feel like you, have, you know you start to get really flushed. You know, I can honestly say that my worst outbursts had nothing to do with the other person. Like they did nothing wrong. It was purely just me, my inadequacies, me feeling stupid, me making a mistake, and just having no idea how to deal with that. And so that to me was that that to me is the biggest you know, surprise out of all of this is people assume that you're, you're mad at other people or people assume, no, it's, it's usually just, you did it. You did something and you don't know how to, how to get yourself out of it. And your only way of dealing with it is to freak out. Well, I mean, I think this comes back to kind of, you mentioned earlier, uh, like the concept of mourning. So you don't want to feel sad when somebody dies. However, that's exactly a very natural, easy piece. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the other thing I want to talk about too, is it never felt good. You know, like I remember when I was, you know, years ago, there was this misconception that like I and like people enjoy it. You know, there's this misconception when people when people get upset or when people have and, and not even limited to me, but there's this misconception that like you like doing it. They're like, oh, yeah, you like being a hothead. You're like, no, it never felt good. Like, like I can distinctly remember, you know, events I went to years ago and, and the car ride home and knowing I'd screwed up, knowing I had gone too far and, and feeling terrible about it. And again, that's no justification and it's no excuse, but it was never something anybody who tilts or anybody who lashes out doesn't enjoy it no one wants to be doing it no one feels good about it you just and again you don't know what to do you know you've screwed up and all you can do is 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 kind of beat yourself up over it and it never i just want to stress that it never feels good it's no one's ever like i just tore someone's head off today no you walk out of the vent you feel terrible about yourself well i think that gets back to you know there's a misconception when it comes to anger especially this idea that like oh yes if i just go Hit like a board game or I mean a, a hit like a punching bag or if I p- throw a pillow or I throw something across the room that that's gonna you know it, it, it releases that anger you know you think of the, the mm-hmm. boiling top coming off there's this idea that like yeah if you do that you're gonna kind of have this cathartic moment the research actually shows this is not true so mm-hmm. what it does is it teaches you that you need to do something when you get angry So all it does is reinforce this idea that if I get angry, I have to throw something, yell, Mm -hmm. scream. It it doesn't actually work as a catharsis as much as people do. I mean, I've actually seen people go into these cathartic parties where it's like they get to go places and break stuff, which is – I would have fun doing that if I was in a good (laughs) – if I'm in a good mood to begin with. But if I'm going in there because I'm angry – and I don't have a way to express that and I go in there and do that, it really just reinforces that idea that – yeah, you. how else are you supposed to express your anger? You have to do something in order to release it or you're just never going to be able to express anger or you're never going to get rid of it. It's just going to build and build and build and build. And, and, and I that, think, yeah, it, sorry. No, go ahead. No, it's just I think I think that's just another form of escape. You know, some people escape through you know drugs or alcohol. I think the the breaking things is an escape where it's like you know you you think you're dealing with it, but you really need to like sit in those feelings and like it's it's ugly and it's messy and you have to deal with it. But I think it, it, the only way to really do it is just kind of look within and be like you know this is the deal and and kind of having that bottom, if you will, that moment of like you know it just can't get any worse than this or just really realizing what what's going on. And so I think the breaking things that you mentioned is just another kind of escape escape that is 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 fine temporarily but you're not even really you're not really dealing with the root of the problem 
Yeah, you. I mean, you mentioned addiction, and I, I think that's a really nice tie-in too, because I mean, the concepts for these emotions and and kind of behaviors are very tied together. We know this, and one of the things that we talk a lot about is the reasons that substances can be very appealing and why they're difficult to give up is they are very, very good at working in the short term. They Mm -hmm. will immediately, for a lot of them, get you out of whatever emotional state that you're not wanting to feel. The -hmm. suppression that you guys, we've talked about before, the avoidance of a social situation, it works really well. We've talked about this numerous times on the cast. Avoidance is a great strategy in the very short term. As you said, Aaron, if you don't ever learn, though, it's okay to feel angry. It's what I do in response to it that becomes problematic or what my behavior is, then yeah, you you may have solved it in the 15, 20 minutes. Then comes the guilt, the not feeling great about yourself. Like you said, the, the, the kind of the letdown and the hangover. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then there's also the, the possibility for a buildup. You know, if you do, you know, if we do, if we do follow what everyone's telling us to do and, and just we'll flip a switch and don't do it, you know, it's going to bottle up. And, you know, worst case scenario, you end up with somebody who doesn't take a loss very well. And it does, it, does get physical or it does get whatever. And so it's very important that you do deal with it early on and you do, you know, look inside and confront it with yourself early on because you don't want it exploding into something much worse. And 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 I, and I don't think I don't think it's a coincidence that we play a game comprised primarily of men and we're having conversations about holding in your emotions. I don't think that's a coincidence. And so, you know, it's very convenient for people to say, well, just don't do it. But I feel like holding in your emotions only leads to to worse outbursts. And um, so I, I think if we don't want it to go there, then that we need to be allowed. And that was something I really rebelled against too. You know, like when I when I was going through it and, and I was trying to look for all this help, you know, I really rebelled against the idea. Like, I think there should be room to express some emotion. Like, I think if my opponent drops three ley lines, I should be able to say something like, gross, you know, <laughs> like I should be able to say something. I don't think I should be able to like flip the table or anything, but to say that like, I can't, I can't say nothing. I can't, I can't, what? Like, yeah, yeah I don't understand that. And and likewise, I, I, I'm really, I'm really fascinated that the conversation now recently has turned into positive emotions. I remember when Ari Lax won that pro tour, there were literal blog posts, like literal headlines that said, it, has Ari Lax gone too far? Is Ari Lax a monster? Because he dared to get excited at a pro tour. And so not only are we having, you know, we've moved on from having conversations about anger. Now we've had this ludicrous discussion of whether or not you can even show excited emotions. Or um, I remember Paulo, Paulo, Paulo won a pro tour recently and people were like, really, you just sat there and fixed your sideboard. You're not going to do anything. And it's like, what do you want us to do? Like, like if we're mad, you don't like it. If we're happy, you don't like it. If we do nothing, you don't like it. And Aaron Forsythe the other day was even just like, so why are, why are we watching if we're not, if no one's going to be expressive, then what's the point? And so I find it very fascinating. Number one, that we're having conversations about guys and their emotions because Lord knows it's always been women for so long. Um, and number two, I find it fascinating that now we're discussing if even positive emotions are if there's even room for those too and so i'm just like how did we get here (laughs) this is exactly where we start getting into the toxic masculinity idea of you know and and i think there's a lot of this too hobbs even though you're a transplant all of us are midwesterners now there's that weird (laughs) emotional suppression thing that everyone does here it's it's the no if i feel something then i'm going to bottle it up and store it in my belly where it will grow and fester and boil until i die and then it'll not be a problem but Mm -hmm. you know even more so it's that way in our society for men and i i you know i've mentioned on the cast before that I'm into sports, I write about sports as one of my other jobs, and this is a discussion that has been going on all across, you know, athletic sports as well as, you know, professional gaming. That suppression not only leads to greater explosions and outbursts later on, the the in-between part is that is that guilt and that fear. Well, it doesn't help that we live in sort of this this call out culture now where like it's not really about helping people be better. It's all about being the one to identify the thing so you can get the likes and so you can get the upvotes. And so it's given me a bit of a complex in terms of, you know, after every event I go to, and I've never really admitted this publicly, I go to Reddit after every event because it's to the point now where I'm so worried that every look, every sigh, you know, did I flip my card the right way? Did I ask for a judge call the right way? Because that can be front page news. And, you know, you can't do this, but if you do this, that's bad. 
and that's not right. And like, you know, I just wasn't really given an opportunity to lay. And a lot of people aren't. No, they don't. They don't. They don't know what they want you to do. It's and that's how I really felt at the time. It was like I was being told that I couldn't do X, and I agreed that I couldn't do X. But then it was like, well, what should I do next? Well, we don't know. And I feel like in the larger conversation of emotions, we haven't really given people that something. We're telling a lot of people what they can't do, but no one's giving people a window to do anything, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, so I work primarily with veterans. I mean, I think people mm-hmm. know that, that I work in the VA and, and that does mean I work, you know, 80 to 90% of my people that I work with are men. And mm-hmm. even the non-men being that they are veterans and in that, in that environment, talk a lot about anger is an acceptable emotion. Um, Mm -hmm. especially in the military, but I would say in in men in general, anger is seen as an acceptable emotion. We Mm -hmm. actually usually talk about anger not as being a, um, we talk about anger as a secondary emotion. It's not a primary. Um, So we talk about the fact that anger itself generally comes with other things. And it's those other things that we are not talking about, whether it's guilt or it's, um, you know, feeling anxiety or we're feeling scared or but i mean it's the idea that usually there's things embarrassment there's things that are underlying anger but anger is seen in some ways as acceptable especially with men i mean it's Mm -hmm. it's like oh yeah he he, yep that's how guys are they're gonna get pissed at each other and then they'll be fine because they exploded yeah it's also seen as it's it's also considered to be and anger and and competition or or being competitive those are seen as unattractive traits in women if if emma goes to an event or if i go to an event and and i'm in my zone and i'm and i'm not able to to address something you know we're seen as aloof we're seen as whatever but if sam black says oh hey i'm in the zone i can't really talk right now or jeff hoagland does it it makes them edgy it makes them focused it makes them whatever you know when when a man asserts himself you know there's that old cliche of, you know, when a man asserts himself, he's seen as as a powerhouse and he's seen as whatever. But when we do it, you know, we're we're bitches, if you will. And so so that's definitely an, an angle to that, too, is like there were times where so one of my one of my bottom moments was there was a thread on Reddit which I've never read. Um, And it was basically a thread of like who the worst people in magic were or something like that. And somebody had started or the the, the thread eventually branched off into me. And and again, I've never read it. And but I had friends who did. And there were some of the things there that did in fact happen. And then there were some things that were simply me just not taking your crap. (laughs) And so, you know, I really felt like if it had been anybody else, it would have been because we do have some assertive pros in this community where and they happen to be men, though, and that is celebrated and that makes them pistols and that makes them whatever. And that was something else I really resented was it was like, would I be getting this sort of backlash if I was a man where, you know, if, if you talk crazy to me at an event and I stand up to you, if that's just not happening and I'm not apologizing for that, you know, were there things I could have handled better? Absolutely. But were there times where you thought I wasn't going to say anything because I was visible? Yeah, that too. And, but I, you know, there were situations that I really feel like I wouldn't have been painted with that brush had I been male, had I been male, it would have been, oh, you know, such a firecracker, such a whatever. But because I was a woman, it was, oh, she's gone too far. And so I do think gender is a very, very important aspect of this conversation that, uh, you know, doesn't get enough um, discussion, enough talk time. And and frankly, I'm kind of relieved to see that guys are being roped into this because for so long, we've always been sort of the emotional ones. And so, you know, I do appreciate that now the guys are kind of having to answer for that and having to having to have this discussion because Lord knows women have had it long enough. <laughs> I mean, what I run into is when I when I start teaching emotions um, and teaching expression of emotions is part of my job people are really bad at identifying their emotions. Now I'm saying, mm-hmm. once again, this is mainly men, but people suck at it. I mean, literally like, yeah. and, and the other interesting thing that I do, so uh, we'll, we'll do exercises where we go around the room and everybody has to name kind of emotions, right? And I start writing them up on the board. Without fail, I don't have to do a lot to direct this. It ends up being that one side of the board has a lot more emotions listed than the other side of the board. <laughs> And uh, so you, you mentioned both positive and negative. I, I, I move away from that definition a little bit. The same with good and bad. Good and bad, mm-hmm. too broad. Like good could be, I feel horny or I feel you know excited. <laughs> or good could just mean like I'm very peaceful right now. I know. I was just trying to think of extreme examples. Joe can change sure. those if he needs to. <laughs> but, but bad could be everything from murderous too depressed and those are very Mm -hmm. different and and same with positive and negative and this goes along with the idea that emotions are natural emotions are things that happen so labeling them positive and negative kind of puts spins on them when i know for a fact that even something like feeling threatened 
can actually lead to positive behavior on my part or mm -hmm. feeling depressed or mournful. If I don't just wallow in that, but I choose to use that as a way to remember, say, a loved one who died. So I choose to do something to remember them. Um, is, is most people on maybe on this cast know, but at least on Twitter know, two years ago, I lost my dog, Bean, who I lost him very quickly to cancer. And he was the dog I'd had the longest. He was mine. And I made the decision when I found that out. I was incredibly sad. I had trouble going to work. But I also decided to spend a week doing things for him. Mm -hmm. And so, so I actually usually talk about healthy and unhealthy emotions in the sense of or helpful or unhelpful because those tend to be the, the emotions, pleasant, unpleasant, because it's what those tend to lead to in terms of our behavior mm -hmm. if we don't do anything about them, Aaron, like you're saying. If we don't do something to try to express them in a healthier way, because the behavior is what gets us into trouble. Yeah. It's the actions. Yeah, and I think, I think it doesn't help that, and, and maybe this is taboo, but I'm gonna go there. It doesn't help either that having emotions has been weaponized at the highest levels to be a bad thing. I remember recently the you know the immigration thing was going off politically when they were talking about you know the the that the kids were being imprisoned and our own president had basically implied that like we need to stop feeling things for these kids and it's like what what? <laughs> and so and you see that in the so we we've reached a point now where it, we we at the highest levels of our society having emotions is seen as a bad thing. Look at the culture wars that have been going on in gaming. A lot of that centers around they like to say facts over feelings, you know, as again implying that feelings are bad, implying that if you have feelings you are less than. You know, the people who are leading these attacks on people whether it be politically or culturally or, or gaming wise, the people leading these attacks are the ones who think they are so brave because they've turned these emotions off. They're like I feel nothing you know I don't care what gender you call me I don't care if this character has cleavage I feel nothing and like it's that they think that empowers them somehow and the opposite is true it's so easy to do that it's so easy to you know to you know to pretend that that things don't matter and, and to do all these things like I said earlier my emotions are my strength and you know while they have certainly got me into trouble at times and still kind of do you know I don't feel that way at all and I think it's really a shame that it, it it's become such a powerful mantra and such a, such a weapon to be used against people. I never would have guessed that in 2018 we would be dealing with such of a pushback against emotions, and that it somehow makes you it somehow makes you seen as less than. And I, I think that's really really scary and just really not true. Yeah, and it's it's a lot of people will say things like I am so you know logical and irrational as, as if emotions have no part in that. Yeah, as if emotions aren't part of of being human, being alive. Right. <laughs> it's kind of confounding or yeah it's like saying you know you get out of a relationship and you're like i am never gonna love again and it's like well cool i guess you know like you know so you're gonna take up knitting or something that's fine but like that's what you you gain you you have to let people in to even get the the, the really good things and so you know it's always a fascinating thing when people just say well i'm just gonna cut off this this side of me and it just it just doesn't work and so you know you you have to you know, there, it does hurt sometimes, you know, when, when your heart gets broken or when you make a mistake, but you know, the, the things that you get out of it are so much, are so much worth the trouble. And, um, it really, it really, you are stronger for feeling ultimately. And I think too, what's fascinating is that people don't often think about not only that emotions aren't weak or less than, but emotions are a, an important part of strategic de decision-making. You mm -hmm. can't have logic without emotion because, emotion is an evolutionary you know process it, it's something that yeah. was created so that you know what the difference between the safe thing and the thing that should make you feel afraid is yeah and and there are bridge in communities too having mm -hmm. emotions are how we can relate to each other and build <laughs> things cooperatively yeah um, so I definitely, you know, for my journey, at least it's been just kind of, you know, finding that balance of not losing my spark again, no pun intended, you know, <laughs> and, and channeling my passion. And so that's why now, you know, that's why you nine times out of 10 will hear me talk about the things I love. And, um, and even, and that's, that's kind of a funny thing too, you know, that one of the criticisms I, I get as a content creator is that, you know, I talk about what I love too much. And if that's a criticism, then I'll totally be that, you know, um, because years ago I would have never done that, you know, years ago it would have been just, just unhappiness. And so, you know, so I try to, 
I try to just kind of do that dance of, you know, having emotions without, you know, consuming me or consuming other people. And, you know, I'd like to think that I've come a really long way and I, I still have a lot more ways to go. And but for me, the, the Jaya Chandra, you know, evolution or the dichotomy is sort of my blueprint of like, yes, you can still have that spark and you can still be feisty and you can still feel. And, and that's sort of what you want to aspire to of, you know, just just learning how to control it and learning how to uh, channel it and temper it. And um, I, I love that storyline so much. And if, if we couldn't make content about things that we love, we wouldn't have this podcast. Like th this, right. <laughs> this is about love and passion for the game and the community between the three of us. Like we just wouldn't be here. And even GP Minneapolis, you know, that was the first GP I can honestly say I played in maybe one side event. I played Commander all weekend, and, and I would have never done that before. You know, I would have played in the sealed. I hate sealed. Um, I would have sat through and just bitched and moaned. And, um, you know, but this was the first time I ever went to a GP, and I was like, you know what? I am not playing in the main. I'm probably not playing in sides, and I'm going to have a great time. And so, again, just doing what you love to do. You know, I woke up that Saturday morning, and I looked at the event list, and I was like, what do I want to do? None of these things. <laughs> <laughs> and I brought my commander deck and I was like, we're going to have fun. And that's what I did all weekend. And that was why I had such a good time at Minneapolis was I asked myself, what do I want to do? And that's what I did. Well, that, that recognition piece is huge. It's a series of events, actually. Um, I lost a really, really good friend, uh, largely because of my nonsense. Um, I had a friend of mine who I'd been friends with for years who basically was like, I just can't deal with your ass anymore. Like, I can't, I can't do it. And so that was a huge impetus to, you know, want to be better. The Reddit thread obviously was huge. I had a local game store who was like, we like you and all, but we can't keep having you chewing people out at FNM because we're going to lose people. So you either got to fix that or you're just not coming back. And so, so losing a really good friend, facing, you know, the potential for, for being kicked out of a game store and I obviously, you know, kind of seeing the impact that I have through that Reddit thread, you know, those were all kind of moments that led to uh, just a really big heart to heart of like, I got to turn this thing around. And so, um, so that was the moment where the ship really turned around. And a lot of it was just getting older. You know, I was, I was 27 when I first started playing Magic again, I'm 35 now. And so a lot of it is just getting older, just kind of realizing the impact that you have on people. And um, yeah, I just, I just kind of had to hit bottom to do that, which is unfortunate. But um, yeah, I think I've made, but you know, I've, I'm not there yet you know i still have moments but i try to make it funny if anything you know, like if i if i'm on stream i try to i try to bless your heart is a thing i like to do now because <laughs> it's a way of showing it's a way of showing displeasure without necessarily because a lot of people don't know what it means and so <laughs> so now if so now if people drop ley lines on me i'll just be like bless your heart and they're like i know right and i'm like that's not what you think it means and yeah, so, yeah. so i try to find just yeah. kind of subtle ways to voice my displeasure or i just have a laugh or i'll just be like yep yeah, that's a line. Like, that's oh, a line. i wish i was dead you know <laughs> um and so i just try to find you know new ways to, to voice my displeasure or just to have fun with it you know i try not to get too too scary or bogged down but i'm still still working on it and and i don't know if i'll ever be there yet but i think i've made i think i've made some good progress <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit so we we did have kind of an outro question and kind of our ending i don't know if people actually did a chance to research this one too so, so we're moving away from characters and we're kind of, you know, we, being that we love flavor text, I think we're probably one of the cast most obsessed with flavor text that I can think of. Um, we came up with kind of a question that can you think of now, same with the one with the character in your emotional state, a flavor text or, or a card in, in general, not necessarily with creatures on it or a character on it that really do match your emotional state right now. So I have two. Can I have two? No. You can have as many as you want, Aaron. Oh, okay. I mean, yes. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to pull rank here, but I'm having to. Oh, wow. um, so, so the first one, uh, the one I, I love the most is a uh, Phyrexian Reclamation, which is a uh, death is no excuse to stop working. And that is, as you know, obviously I'm a big dredge player, but just in terms of life, it's like, you know, you get people where it's like, you know, oh God, I had this terrible day. That's nice. You got to work. Like that's, you can feel those feelings and you can have your pity party, but this is no excuse to stop working. And so if I have a bad day at work or even just, I had a really bad year, you know, I broke up with my boyfriend, my cat died. I quit my job. I was unemployed. You know, all of those things, I, I allowed myself to feel what I was going through in all of those situations, but ultimately that's no excuse to stop working. And so you still got to get a bed. You still got to work or work in my case, you know, W E R K. Um, but that's sort of my motivation too. You, you know, it's just, it's just my motivation of you can't stay down. That's no excuse. You can be dead, but you still got to get up and work. And then another one I have, I can't remember what it is, but the flavor text is you'll never miss what you never had. And that's one of the early visions, Tempest cards. I don't remember which one it is, maybe even Mirage. It was on an artifact, but that's another thing I like to tell myself is that there are certain things that happen in life where I'll be like, you know, Oh, I really wish I could have done this or, Oh, this would have been so great. It's like, yeah, but you never had that. Like, you know, 
you, what are you what are you upset for? Like you never had that guy, you never had that card, you never had that deck. Like you can't mourn something you never really had. And so that's something I use to kind of check myself when I feel like I'm again getting too emotional. Where it's just I, I sometimes spend too much time thinking about what might have been or what could have been. Well, you never had it, so there's no use getting upset about it. And so that's something I use to to pull myself out of the hole sometimes. Following similar to my my pick for the opening, I'm I'm gonna go with Gideon's reproach from uh, from Dominaria. Because the, the flavor text is, on Amonkhet, Gideon lost both of his Sural and his faith in himself. But he can still throw a punch, and he still knows a bad guy when he sees one. Oh, man. And that, I think, speaks to he's lost a lot, but he has his he, he has a place to start from. He, he's starting to rebuild himself, and he has some, some ideals and a starting point, and he knows where he's at, and he's going to start building from there kind of doing what he can i'm gonna stay on flavor with that and as uh as somebody who has recently embraced the inner red mage in his heart uh, i'm gonna go with cathartic reunion from kaladesh mm. and uh mm. just that is one of the most beautiful alternate representations of red in that i've i've ever seen it's it's chandra embracing her mother pia nalar and um the flavor text itself says the chasm of years and worlds collapsed under the power of their embrace that to me is just the most beautiful representation of red emotion talking about positive emotions made me think of i would go to my roots with storm playing um because i have never actually looked i was just while we were going through this i've been looking at cards that are important to me and seeing flavor texts and i had not looked at the flavor text before for lion's eye diamond um which Mm -hmm. is one of my favorite cards ever in magic just because of we've established i'm so not a spike that i just like (laughs) to play cards that are fun and need work to to make them work and lion's eye diamond is one of those and Mm -hmm. the flavor text says held in the lion's eye which is a zalafrin saying meaning caught in the moment of crisis Mm -hmm. and why it's important to me is because i am not in a moment of crisis right now but i talk a lot about mental health recovery and with that, we talk about this idea of being able to recognize your emotions and recognize what's going on so that you can avoid hitting that crisis, that rock bottom. And I'm thinking with everything that's been going on in my life right now, not getting caught in the moment of crisis is very important to me. So I need to remember my lion's eye. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we've hit on a lot of the points that we want to do, especially because we're we're going to be basically breaking Aaron up into a two-parter because there's been just there's so much to talk about with you, Aaron. Oh boy. Is this going to be like a like a magician's thing where you're going to like saw me in half or something? Or <laughs> I'm not saying that it isn't. <laughs> so I'm not opposed. I'm on that note. Note. That's our show. You can find Aaron Campbell on Twitter at Original Estrus. That's Original O-E-S-T-R-U-S. And you can find her on her own podcast, The Magic Mike's Podcast. That's at Magic M-I-C-S cast on Twitter. The show can be found on Twitter at Goblin Lore Pod, or you can email us any questions, comments, or concerns at GoblinLorePodcast at gmail.com. Joe Redman can be found on Twitter at Findhorn, that's F-Y-N-D Horn. Hobbs Q can be found at Hobbs Q. And Alex Newman can be found at Alexander New M. Goblin Lore is a member of the Geek Therapy Network. Geek Therapy celebrates how geek culture can save the world through podcasts, videos, blog posts, community outreach, education, and convention appearances. It's a network of like-minded creators who believe that all different facets of nerd culture are important to understanding how our minds and communities work. Check them out at geektherapy.com or at geektherapy on Twitter. Thank you all for listening, and remember... Goblins, like snowflakes, are only dangerous in numbers.